Uh, I'm sure most of you know who Luke Gower is not, I'll just give him a quick introduction there. Uh, he first, uh, well, I suppose he's probably most famous for being a cannabis activist, uh, probably one of the first, uh, at least one of the earliest and one of the loudest, and he's very much probably been doing it for himself for many years on his own before other organisations like LCI and Normal and here ourselves in UCC, the Awareness and Reform Society, uh, got involved. Um, he's been running an election pretty much every two or three years since 1997, and he's gone from being a councillor to a deputy mayor to being a mayor, and now being in the parliament of the TD. Uh, I'd just like to welcome him here on behalf of the society, uh, thank him for coming down. I know he's been an inspiration for me and Gray and other individuals for several years, so it's great to have him here. So uh, everyone give a round of applause for living, can you? Increase and decrease in prevalence. 
Marijuana is the most popular legal drug used in the world today. Therefore, people who have used less popular drugs, such as heroin, cocaine, and LSD, are likely to have also used marijuana. Most marijuana users never use any other legal drug. Indeed, for the large majority of people, marijuana is a terminus rather than a gateway drug, according to The Lancet magazine. To compound this fact, in March 1999, the Institute of Medicine in Washington, D.C. issued a report on various aspects of marijuana, including the so-called gateway theory. The Institute of Medicine concluded there is no conclusive evidence that the drug effects of marijuana are causally linked to the subsequent abuse of other illicit drugs. Now that's not Ronnie Kenny now, that is the Institute of Medicine in Washington, D.C. Now I think one of the strongest arguments against the whole gateway theory is if you actually look at the Netherlands and you look at a study that was produced by the Trimbos Institute, a psychiatric think tank uh, over there that does massive studies. I think that this particular study looked at 5,000 teenagers. And in their study, they showed that Dutch teenagers were, they had a chance of less than one in a thousand of experimenting with heroin. Now the figure for Ireland, now these are uh, studies and statistics and who knows how true they are, but they can't be that far off. Some figures suggest that 1 in 50 people have tried heroin in this country. Some studies, or teenagers have tried it. Some studies would suggest around 1 in 100. But let's say it's 1 in 100. You compare that to the figures that have been shown to be true by the Trimble's Institute. It shows that in a country where you can openly purchase cannabis, and you are 10 times less likely as a teenager to progress on to using heroin. So, I mean, if there's truth in the gateway theory, teenagers or people in Holland, it, they should all nearly have heroin problems at this stage. And there is also this idea that needs to be tackled, this whole idea of it damaging your motivation. Now, it's like this. As far as I'm concerned, if anyone has a motivation problem and they use cannabis, the problem isn't the cannabis, the problem is them. It is the individual. And according to the World Health Organization, they looked at adult gay motivation. They basically said, it is doubtful that cannabis use produces a well-defined motivation and syndrome. The report also notes that the value of studies which support the adult gay motivation theory are limited by their small sample sizes and lack of representative social slash cultural groups. People are more likely to get a degree, actually, if they use cannabis. That is a fact. But does that mean cannabis makes you smart? No, that's bullshit. That would be going down the route of mixing up correlation and causation. The reason why you're more likely to get a degree if you use cannabis is because you're probably more likely to get it in college. But if I was to apply the same logic to causation and correlation that some of these scientists do, I would now be concluding that you should smoke loads of cannabis and you'll probably get a doctorate if you smoke loads. <laughs> so you've got to be careful of mixing up correlation and causation. Another supposed argument for banning cannabis is that it causes brain damage. Now, this is not true. The brain damage argument is based on what is known as the Dr. Eat to Land study. Now, this is an old study, but it is one that is, they don't mention the details on it, but it's the one that people are referring to when they say it causes brain damage. And the study involved this. In this study, rhesus monkeys were strapped into a chair and then strapped into gas masks and given the equivalent of 63 Colombian strength joints in five minutes, give the laugh, losing no smoke. As a result of smoking this marijuana, the monkeys ended up with brain damage. What the study remarkably ignores is that the monkeys' brains are in fact damaged by oxygen deprivation, and not by cannabis. But then again, no one should be surprised as to what depth prohibitionists will go. Because believe it or not, in the 50s, in the United States, one of the scare tactics which was put out, and if you got a laugh out of the last one, you're definitely going to get a laugh out of this one, was that it made men grow breasts. That is a fact. Well, it's not a fact. 
That's what they said was a fact. And I suppose the obvious punchline is, if that was true, uh, then I would be on page three every day of the week. <laughs> studies done and carried out on the whole issue of brain damage was one which was done in the John Hopkins University, the research university in Baltimore, one of the most respected research institutes in the world. 1,300 people were studied over a 15 year period and the conclusion was as follows, no significant differences in cognitive decline between heavy users, light users and non-users of cannabis. Now, I didn't, I don't have anything on them in the John Hopkins University. I have no knowledge that the chief researcher is a paedophile and I'm going to out him if he doesn't agree with me. I'm not holding these people over a barrel. They did this study. They came to these conclusions. And there's one thing for sure. The John Hopkins Research University is not going to put its whole reputation at stake just to keep me and you happy. They came to the conclusions because they are true. Now, in the last year, our wonderful media in this country reported negative impacts on IQ, intelligent quotient, for people who use cannabis during adolescence. Now, it scared an awful lot of people, and rightfully so. It should scare an awful lot of people. But what they forgot to tell us was that Actually, it wasn't all bad news. What the full news was, was that they conclusively proved that if you smoke it as an adult, it does not damage your IQ at all, in any way. And what it did prove is that if you want to minimize any damage caused by cannabis, what you do is you legalize it and you make it more difficult for adolescents to get it. In the same way as they do in Holland or the Netherlands, call it what you want. If you are caught selling to a minor and you run a coffee shop, you won't be running a coffee shop anymore. It will be closed down. Whereas in Ireland, we have a situation where the people who sell it, they don't ask for identification. They don't give a damn, a lot of them, who they sell it to. So if we're worried about it damaging people's IQs, and we have a study out there that shows, not causally, but there's a correlation between use as an adolescent and negative uh, IQ scores, well then you should make it more difficult for young people to get it. And there's a fairly obvious way to do that. Now, about eight or nine years ago, the, uh, I actually believe the arguments, the medical arguments against legalizing cannabis had been beaten. And then we had what I would call Reefer Madness 2. <laughs> Reefer Madness 2 was a follow on from the previous Reefer Madness in the States, and schizophrenia became the new enemy. We were all going to become schizophrenics if we used cannabis. And any amount of studies were trotted out. The details that weren't looked at very closely by the media and causality and correlation, well, sure, fuck them. Who cares if there's a difference? Now, if you have a good look at it and have a look at what's reported out there, if you have a good read, you'll see that actually there isn't a lot of evidence for this. Reuters reported that there is no scientific proof that cannabis use induces schizophrenia. They were reporting the magazine for psychiatry, a peer-reviewed journal based in the Netherlands, which analyzed all available evidence on the issue. And the three authors concluded that there was no justification for saying it. And they all, there was also numerous, numerous studies looked at. Uh, and the main, the main studies that are kind of thrown at you from, a, from the schizophrenia angle are the Swedish conscript study. And the Swedish conscript study has been, basically according to Lancet magazine, it has said that it does not prove that cannabis use causes schizophrenia. Whereas if you were to pick up many publications in this country, it would be almost definite that it did. And the, what you call it, the, the Lancet magazine said about one of these studies, 
It said this study, it said about the Swedish study, this study does not establish whether adolescent cannabis use was a consequence for pre-existing psychotic symptoms rather than a cause. The Lancet magazine said a declining incidence of treated cases of schizophrenia over the period when cannabis use has increased suggests, however, that cannabis use is unlikely to have caused causes of cases of schizophrenia that would not otherwise have occurred. This observation suggests that chronic use may precipitate schizophrenia in vulnerable individuals, an effect that would not be expected to change incidence. But surely the biggest case study you can look at of all is the fact that according to Trevor Turner, consultant psychiatrist at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, and Vice President of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, succinctly destroyed the claims by saying, in spite of an eight to 10 fold increase in cannabis use in Britain over the past 30 years, now we'd be expecting an epidemic now in the increase in schizophrenia, going by this evidence, but remarkably, well not remarkably, the reality is schizophrenia and the cases of schizophrenia reported have actually gone down. Even though, over the last 30 years, the number of people who use cannabis in Britain has increased 8 to 10 fold. So, you can look at the studies, you can pull them apart all you want. But if the use of cannabis increased the incidence of schizophrenia, then surely, if after 30 years in Britain where 8 to 10 times more people are using it, we should see an epidemic. We don't. We actually see that less people are actually using it. So you could ask the question then, why is there a correlation? You know, why is there some sort of a connection? Why can they make a connection? One of the analysis that I have heard is that the onset of schizophrenia mainly comes about in around uh, the adolescent period in your life, between your late teens. And also you are more statistically proven more likely to try cannabis around that age. But that doesn't mean one causes the other. To conclude one co that cannabis causes schizophrenia, to conclude that would be the same as concluding that if you met an obese person, that you would blame their large size clothing for their obesity problem. You would not do that, because obviously it didn't cause it. It is an obvious consequence of it. So the question is, is there any other drugs out there that we should be worried from the point of view of mental illness and uh, schizophrenia and all that? Uh, I wonder, is there? Well, coffee. Coffee does it. So maybe we should ban it in the morning. I'll read a few things here about coffee. If we were to be consistent on cannabis. Long-term overuse of ca caffeine can elicit a number of psychiatric disturbances. Two such disorders recognized by the Amer American Psychiatric Association are caffeine-induced sleep disorder and caffeine-induced anxiety disorder. In the case of caffeine-induced sleep disorder, an individual regularly ingests high doses of caffeine sufficient to induce a significant disturbance in his or her sleep. Banned immediately. In some individuals, the lar large amounts of cannabis can induce anxiety severe enough to necessitate clinical attention. This caffeine-induced anxiety disorder takes many forms, from generalized anxiety to panic attacks, obsessive compulsive symptoms, or even phobic symptoms. Because this condition can mimic organic mental disorders such as panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, even schizophrenia, oh my god, a number of medical professions believe caffeine intoxicated people are routinely misdiagnosed and unnecessarily medicated when the treatment for caffeine induced psychosis would simply be to actually stop it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if they were banning cannabis because it caused mental problems, well then I'm afraid Mansfield House is in serious trouble <laughs> because there are more studies out there to show that it does more harm. But we don't hear anything about that, do we? And really, would it make sense banning it? No, it wouldn't. It's got to be pragmatic in this world. So, then there's the issue of, if they haven't got you with that one, well, you're going to get cancer if you smoke it. Definitely. 100%. There's no uh, escape from it. And if everyone wants to prove, 
There you go. For Shanghai. <laughs> cancer and cancer. You may have heard that it causes lung cancer, and that it is five or seven or ten times more harmful than tobacco. Now, excuse me now if I'm not being very accurate on the number of times more harmful it is than tobacco. There's a reason for it, though. Every time I pick up a newspaper, there's a new random number in there. Just make it up as you go along. That is a fact. I have picked up newspapers one day, and I've discovered there's five times more tar in cannabis than there is in tobacco. The next day, there's seven times more. Jesus, I, I, I'm thinking, by the time I read the newspaper next year, you'll be able to tar the bloody roads with the thing. So, <laughs> so be, let's look at the reality of this. The largest study of its kind has unexpectedly concluded that smoking marijuana, even regularly and heavily, heavily, does not lead to lung cancer. Now, just to prove that I don't come down here and look for studies that suit me, before this study came out, I stood in this theatre years ago and I said that I believed cannabis smoking caused cancer because that was the evidence available at the time. Well, today I'm telling you the evidence says otherwise. Now, I use logic to conclude, basic logic, what I thought, to conclude that it caused cancer. Sure, smoking something over your lungs, breathing it in over your lungs, sure, how the hell could that be anything other than bad? But let's look at the biggest study of all time. The new findings were against our expectations, said Donald Tashkin of the University of California at Los Angeles, a pul pulmonologist who has studied marijuana for 30 years. Federal health and drug enforcement officials have widely used Tashkin's previous work on marijuana to make the case against the drug being dangerous. They don't want to talk to him anymore, strangely enough. He said, we hypothesized that there would be a positive association between marijuana use and lung cancer, and that the association would be more positive with heavier use, he said. What we found instead was no association, that isn't remarkable, at all, and even a suggestion of some protective effect. Tashkin's study, funded by the National Institute of Health's National, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, involved 1,200 people in Los Angeles who had lung, neck, and head cancer, and an additional 1,040 people without cancer, matched by age, sex, and neighborhood. They were all asked about their lifetime use of cannabis, tobacco, and alcohol. The heaviest man marijuana smokers had lighted up more than 22,000 times, while moderately heavy usage was defined as smoking 11,000 to 22,000 marijuana cigarettes. Tashkin found that even the very heavy marijuana smoker showed no increased incidence of the three cancers studied. That is remarkable. And to me, when I read that, I have to say, I was very happy for selfish reasons. Because I had smoked marijuana for years. And this was damn good news. Damn good news. Now, while no association between marijuana and smoking and cancer was found, the studies, studies findings presented to the American Thoracic Society International Conference did find, now remember what they're telling you here, five, ten, pick your number more harmful, did find a 20-fold increase in lung cancer among people who smoked two or more packs of cigarettes a day. The study was limited to younger people your people younger than 60, because those older than that were generally not exposed to marijuana in their youth. Why, which at a time when it's most often tried. So that study is factual. This is the guy who was telling people it was more cancerous originally. And I didn't just read it off the internet. I rang this guy. I spoke to him for an hour and a half on the phone. And he was actually very forthcoming, like a... Uh, I, out of the blue, I rang him and he spoke to me for an hour and a half. And he said it himself, the study was pretty much set up to prove that cannabis was bad. And that's why he started off with the phrase, surprisingly, at the beginning of his, uh, of his study. Now, something that has been thrown out lately is that 
you could maybe have legalised cannabis 30 years ago, but we're not talking about the same thing anymore. It's way more potent nowadays. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. The studies that they are looking at are studies which was done on marijuana in the 60s in the United States, which was held in storage, which had denatured THC in it, that showed there was about 0.5% THC in it. And in comparison to some of the marijuana that was around at the time, it was, it was the wrong comparison to, to make. There is nothing new about high potency cannabis. During the 60s, it was available in premium varieties such as Acapulco Gold, Panama Red, etc., as well as in the form of hashish and hash oil, which were every bit as strong as today's sensibilia, but were ignored by government in potency statistics. While the average potency of domestic pot or cannabis, as we call it pot in the States, did increase with the development of sensibilia in the 70s, the range of potencies available has remained virtually unchanged since the last century, when extremely potent tonics were sold at the counter in pharmacies. Simple facts are this. In the 70s, you could get marijuana, and you could put it in isopropyl alcohol, or you could uh, put butane through it, and you could end up with 99% THC. That was possible at the time. Nothing new has changed. You heard them talking about scum. Oh, scum is so much worse. They talk about scum like it's, it, it, it's, it's a particular type of cannabis. Scum is as much a type of cannabis as Guinness is a type of alcohol. It's a bloody brand. And to be quite honest, I am not a big fan of cannabis that has THC levels that are way up there and CBD levels that are way down there that leaves you wired. Now, more than most alcohol drinkers don't like to drink absinthe on Saturday night. <laughs> but the, rea the, re the, re the reality is, you don't have any bloody choice uh, under the current regime because, well, really, um, you don't know what you're bloody smoking. So, this idea that it's got more potent, and that's the reason why we can't legalise it now, is complete and utter erroneous bullshit. It is not true. Unless maybe uh, people didn't know how to make tinctures hundreds of years ago, they did know how to make tinctures hundreds of years ago. In fact, it's even in the Bible, it's suggested that there was hashish oil there and then. And how did they make it? Well, they didn't create some amazing new strain of cannabis that had never been heard before. They just used their head. So, from, from the point of view of banning it from, you know, it's going to kill you, and it's going to do that, this or that to you. Really, those arguments don't stack up. But if you are interested in people's health, and if the government are interested in people's health, and they tell us they are, well then they should legalise it in the morning. But because, because it is illegal, it is actually far more dangerous. And you probably know this. Cannabis at the moment is cut with anything and everything. It's cut with silicon, it's cut with glass, it's cut with sugar, hairspray, etc. to bulk up the weight. Now, do you need to be a genius to work out that it is obviously better that people don't smoke something with glass in it. <laughs> smoke something with Largactol, a psychiatric drug in it in so far. It's obviously more harmful because they've made it illegal. There is also another harm that comes out of it. If you are a smoker and you are busted, it has mental health impacts on you. And that is a fact. And this you're a very, very tough cookie. There's no point everyone pretending they're that tough. It is difficult on you mentally when the guard come into your house. It is difficult because when you live in a society you like to think that society, it's on your side, and society is built in such a way that it's for the good of everyone. But after that experience, in your head it doesn't feel like that anymore. And if they're worried about people who have schizophrenia, and they're worried about cannabis causing schizophrenia, let them look at the fact that one of the biggest causes of schizophrenia is stress. And you stole my line earlier. How the hell does it help someone? with a propensity towards getting schizophrenia, to strip-search them, 
to call them a drug addict, to laugh at them, and then run them out of the garden station afterwards and make them feel like dirt. How does that help you if you have a propensity towards getting schizophrenia? I tell you what it'll do. It'll increase the likelihood of you getting schizophrenia, not decrease it. Another downside from a health point of view, if they're really interested in it, is that if you buy cannabis, you don't know how strong it is. It's like going out buying a glass of, a liquid glass of alcohol and going, randomly, I'll down that. It could be tequila, it could be slur, it could be whatever. But you don't know anywhere in between. So, no more than if you didn't know the strength of the alcohol you were drinking. And the first time you ever tried it, you blew your head off. From forever a day afterwards, you'd go around telling me, oh, that, that alcohol, oh my God, don't go near it. I nearly went insane. <laughs> Same thing with cannabis. People have never smoked it before. And they smoke, uh, uh, let me see, grapefruit diesel or something like that. And they just blow their bloody head off them. In the same way as a glass of brandy would blow the head off them if they've never actually drank before. And then there's also this thing of, you know, cannabis isn't as uniform as some people think it is. All cannabis doesn't relax you. All cannabis doesn't get you high. It all depends what type of cannabis you smoke. There are two main types, indica and sativa. Indica chills you out, sativa, they want to run for a run. I do a lot of running on sativa. Well, I do, sorry. <laughs> an anxious sort of an individual naturally. Nowadays, your mates are having a smoke and you join in. It can do you damn harm. It won't do you any good. But if you knew beforehand what it was going to do, at least you'd have that information there to make a solid decision. At the moment, you are basically blindfolded in the pub and people are throwing stuff down your throat. You haven't a clue what's going on. So, if they're worried about people's health, well, then maybe they should uh, legalise it. So, I hope I've proven that from a health point of view, uh, that it should be legalised. There are also many, many social benefits to legalising it. And I actually think one of the biggest ones is increasing people's willingness to engage with the Garda Shirkana on crime. And I never broke any law until I started smoking cannabis. I was, as the, the saying goes, an otherwise law-abiding citizen. I had no problems with the Garda Shirkana. I was right to not have any problems with them. But the thing is, if you're a logical person, and you're a cannabis smoker, and you use logic to justify why you're doing what you're doing, and then you get a criminal record for it and the guards come into your house and they strip search you, etc. And they do it to you 16 times in 18 months like they did to me. Okay, I believe in the law, I'm a legislator and I try and rise above that. But let's say you're a young lad or a young girl and you're here in Cork and you go out for the night. And you're caught with a joint and you're dragged before the courts and uh, you get a hard time and uh, you're told you're a bad boy or a girl by the guards. The chances in the future of you actually doing anything to report a crime have been lessened massively because you are now starting to question every law, wrongly or rightly. I think that would be one of the biggest benefits to legalising it. It would, it would, for someone like me, I wouldn't be an otherwise law-abiding citizen. I would be an actual law-abiding citizen. So, from that point of view, I think it would make a massive difference. But the other uh, social, uh, the obvious uh, social benefits out of it are that at the moment, if you're caught in possession of cannabis and you end up with a criminal record, you have the equivalent criminal record in many senses. Now, people would kind of laugh if, 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 if you talk to them about cannabis. But uh, you end up with a criminal record, it's no laughing matter. You have the equivalent problems in many ways as someone who is criminalised for being a paedophile. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, if in the future you ever want to work in a job 
working with children, you won't be allowed. If you want to become a doctor, you won't be allowed. If you want to be a teacher, you won't be allowed. I'm well, sorry, unless you lie on your application form, you won't be allowed. If you want to do any job that pays well in this country, you won't be allowed. I filled in a job application for a factory in my town about eight years ago, and I filled it in truthfully. I could not be given the job because I was a health and safety threat, because I had a criminal record for possession of cannabis. So, you look at the fact that I tried to get the figures off and the chatter as to how many people have to put up with this shit. How many people have a criminal record for possession of cannabis? I'll tell you something remarkable. The state actually doesn't know how many people have a criminal record for cannabis possession. Now you might say, why don't you look at the statistics from the last few years and add them all up? Well, you could do that all right, but that wouldn't allow for people like me, gurriers like me, who have a record on five occasions. So you don't actually get the proper numbers. But what I do know is, there is a minimum of 100,000 people in this country who cannot actually get a decent, well-qualified job. It gets worse, though. There's 100,000 people in this country who, in the teeth of an economic crisis and an unemployment crisis, cannot go to Australia, cannot go to the United States of America. Now, I can be brash about it and say, if they don't want me, I don't want to bloody go there. But it has a massively negative impact on their lives, like. And that has had an impact on a, over a hundred thousand people in this country at the moment. Now, people talk about the tax take you get from legalizing cannabis. What about the increased tax take if you allowed all of those people to do what they were capable of doing? And then on the other hand, they'll say, oh, we have a study showing that people who are criminal record for cannabis don't tend to do well in life. Do you wonder why? You don't bloody let them, do you? <laughs> now, there is a worse situation than those. If you have a row with your partner, and you have kids, and they are in any way vindictive at all, in other words, if they're human, and they decide to play that, you have a criminal record card, you will potentially never, ever see your children again. My wife would do that to me in the morning because I have a criminal record. And I know she would because she's a social care worker and she knows it inside out. And that is a fact. Now, we are doing that to a hundred thousand people. Not only do I want cannabis legalized, what I want after it is legalized, I want an apology. I want an apology for the damage that this state has done to over a hundred thousand people's lives by this stupid law. They have done serious damage to people's lives. So that reason alone, I think we need to go down the road of legalization because it is it has massive, massive negative impacts. Now, do you know it's kind of funny? The only two jobs you can actually get are you can become a politician <laughs> and actually you can become a parent until you have a row with your partner. So the two important jobs you can still actually kind of do. So finally, I want to talk about financial implications. What would happen to us financially if we legalized it? Now, you can only get ballpark figures on this because really you're only there are only theories until you actually do it. But uh, the library and research section in the Dáil, uh, I contacted them and I asked them uh, would they be able to get together any information on what they knew about uh, the value of the cannabis market in other countries if there was any available, the cost to uh, the legal system, uh, cost to uh, policing, etc. And they gave me a figure of a conservative estimate of 468 million euros a year to work to the Irish economy. That is three times more than if every last person in this country paid their 100 euro household tax. And you wouldn't have pissed off anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it actually pays an awful lot of people. 
Now, Legalizing cannabis around the planet has been removed. 
because the United States of America has been a big driver in the enforcement of the single convention on uh, narcotic drugs which came in in 1961 and was amended in 1972. Now I know they don't give a damn for the UN when it suits them but on the drug issue they love uh, to cite this. Well the reality is uh, as it turns out when the legal people looked at it uh, that, cannot, that will not be a problem for legalization in the United States of America. But the most important part about this is that the major, the biggest country, the most important country that was preventing it happening in other countries and putting pressure on other countries, including the Netherlands, has now actually done it itself in two states. And it looks like it's going to spread like wildfire over the next few years because campaign, the campaign teams in Washington and Colorado have now moved into other states. So. They cannot, as a country, preach to us anymore that uh, it is the wrong thing to do. And we have seen a situation where the Uruguayan president has said that they're going to legalize it. It looks like it's going to happen in uh, Mexico, as I've already said. They have uh, clubs in, in, uh, in Spain. Uh, my uh, parliamentary assistant had a enjoyable spoke in Barcelona uh, over the summer. In uh, Portugal, they have decriminalized all drugs. Uh, and uh, Time magazine, which uh, you can hardly call, uh, uh, well, you can hardly, hardly call liberal in any way, they have said it was a massive success. So, from a political point of view, this is not radical anymore. This is something that's been supported by Republicans in the United States. So, um, will they pass it in the dawn when I put it before them? I don't expect them to. We'll put it like that. I'm not going to say they won't, because that's been very negative. Uh, I go into these things with a very positive attitude. If you want to, if you were me, if you started off 15 years ago in politics. But will they vote for it? Who knows? I'll say that. But what I do know is that for the first time ever in Dawn Aaron, on a Tuesday night between half seven and nine o'clock, there will be one and a half hours of solid debate on the legalisation of cannabis. And I do know on that night, I will get a 15 minute opener speech. And I do know that the following night, on Wednesday, between half seven and nine o'clock, there will be another hour and a half of debate, 100% dedicated to the legalisation of cannabis. And we will, for the first time, in a mature, adult, responsible way, be able to discuss and debate this. And I hopefully will be able to educate people and change a few minds. A few people have privately told me that they will support it. I'm not going to tell anyone who they are at the moment. But even if it's only one other person, at least it's a marker. It tells you where we are. But we're not going to give up that easily either. We're not going to give in to this idea that they won't vote for it. What I need ye to do in the run up to it is to get on to your local TD. Put the arguments to them, financial, social, and health-wise, as to why it should be legal. Tell them they'll never vote for them again unless they vote for it. Tell them you'll be watching how they vote that night in the dawn. I publish how exactly everyone voted. And that's how we actually do it. But on that night, there is one major thing that needs to be done. We need to show them that we are willing to fight on this one. And we are willing to protest. Now, Kevin did an excellent job along with Anthony and a few other people in organising the protests last year and in Cork, people have done a brilliant job of organising protests. But I know people are afraid to come to them. I know they are. I know people are wary of coming to these marches and I know there would be more at them if they weren't wary. So on that night, what I intend to do is I hope to mobilise the 100,000 plus people who had nothing to lose by turning up outside Dáil Éireann. And I hope they will be joined by other people who can come and I would say advisedly wear a disguise. That's a fact. Because your life can be in serious trouble if you get connected to this. I know it. I have lived it. I have had nightmares about it. But on that evening, in order to sway these people, we need to get, we're not going to get the 100,000. We're not going to get 50,000. But even if 10% of those people who have had their lives destroyed 
by this law were to turn up outside the gates of all Ireland, and another 10,000 people who feel strongly enough it were to turn up outside all Ireland, what would we have? We have the biggest crowd outside all Ireland since this doll came together two years ago. And no first count. And in the same way as an alcoholic needs a drink, a politician needs a vote. And they'll do anything for it. Anything. Even if they don't agree with it. They will go for it. And if they're not Now, I learned a massive le uh, lesson in a campaign that I suppose you would say is a million miles away from the legalization of cannabis. It's a campaign to legalize the use of turf. And uh, I learned something there. It's taught me an awful lot. And we had a protest outside the door. Now, they shafted us afterwards, but believe me, we made them listen that night. We put 5,000 people outside the door. And as I understand it, for the first time in 16 years, the go a government withdrew an amendment to a motion and voted for my motion on that night. Now, it wasn't just the 5,000 plus people outside that did it. We created a thing that I like to call 3D democracy. Normally, when you stand up in the doll, you address pretty much an empty chamber. And who was ever in the gallery, and whoever was watching UBC, and whoever is drunk watching our office room. <laughs> <laughs> On that night, we made use of technology. We took a feed, a, a live feed from inside the air, and played it outdoor on the speakers. So when I stood up to speak in the door, I wasn't addressing these people, I directly addressed the 5,000 outside. And you could I, by the way, I also supplied them with 500 whistles and 500 new New Zealanders. And when I... And when I was to speak, you could hear them inside the door. It was phenomenal. The hair, you hear the phrase, the hair didn't rise on the back of my neck. I, I look like a monkey at the end. That much hair sticking out. It was phenomenal. So, will they vote for it? Who knows? But by God, will we make it difficult for them not to? And afterwards as well, what you need to be doing is, on your phones outside, you need to have your mobile number of your local representative, and you need to be texting them, we're out here, will you come out and talk to us? Explain why you voted for me to be a criminal. Explain why you voted to allow a half a billion euro of resources to go into the hands of the type of people who shot Veronica Gearing. Come out here and explain to me why that's better than spending it on recreational facilities. Come out here and explain to me how it's better than persecuting someone who might have schizophrenia. Come out here and explain to me why you did this in my name. Because remember, you wouldn't be there without me. And that's how we will get change. But the one way we will definitely get change is if you don't give up, you can never, ever be beaten. Thank you very much.